Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Fran Hackney. Um, I moved to Holland in uh, 2015 from East Lansing, and I became a HASS member that fall, I think, um, which has been a wonderful asset in Holland, as we all know. And then um, last year, I became a member of the uh, Social Science Subcommittee. And one of our jobs, of course, is to uh, bring classes to HASP. So I thought, what shall I do? And then I thought, I know, I'll ask my son <laughs> to present a class. <laughs> so let me introduce my son, Stephen Hackney. Uh, he is from Chicago. He's uh, worked for uh, Kirkland and Ellis for the last 22 years. And he was involved in the bankruptcy of Detroit in 2013, 2014, uh, which was really quite a remarkable event because it's so unusual for a large city to actually uh, confront bankruptcy. Um, so I thought this would be a, a pretty interesting topic uh, for this group. So a little bit about my son. Uh, we, uh, he was raised in East Lansing and he, went, he after uh, high school, he went to Rice University in Houston and then the University of Chicago for law school. And then he has been in Chicago ever since. So uh, here is Steve Hackney. All right. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I would have told you I was a trial lawyer at Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago, but I retired two weeks ago. So now yeah. I'm, a, I'm a retired trial lawyer. Um, and you might be wondering why a retired trial lawyer is here. And as my mom said, it is because I had this unique opportunity to be involved with the bankruptcy of the city of Detroit. And we're going to spend a lot of time over the next two classes talking about that. But I wanted to make sure that I assured you that uh, I know that I'm in Holland, Michigan. And I want to assure you that my mother was born in the Netherlands. So she is 100% Dutch. Uh, my brother, who is here, and I are 50% Dutch. My dad was an interloper. So um, I think we qualify under the statutory requirements of the city of Holland in terms of the minimum Dutch requirement. So my niece, Annika, took the day off from school and is here today. She's a top student at Black River High School. She's 75 or she's 50% Dutch as well, I think. So she's also allowed to be here. Um, <laughs> The bad news, though, is that my mom and both of her sisters, uh, both of my uncles, my brother, my sister-in-law, they went to Calvin College. Yeah, so we're from the bad side of the <laughs> Dutch tree. Um, but uh, this is the first time I've done something like this, so you'll have to bear with me. I hope it goes well. I put a lot of time into it. And I'm gonna keep my eye on the clock to try to make sure that this all works correctly from a time standpoint. And what I would say is that if it doesn't go well, just remember that we should all blame my mom. Um, but the main reason I'm here is because I had this experience in, in the city of Detroit. The, um, uh, the bankruptcy of the city of Detroit was often portrayed as a battle between the people of the city who wanted good municipal services, they wanted to live in a vibrant city, the pensioners of the city, people who had worked for the city for a long time and were expecting the city to make good on their pensions, and then the financial creditors of the city who had loaned the city money and wanted to be paid back. And I work for a very large law firm in Chicago, and I'll give you one guess uh, as to which of those parties I represented. Okay, so I represented uh, the financial creditors. Let me see if I can get this guy uh, working here. Um, I don't know if this guy has lost his connection, but it'll be good if we get this sorted. Do I need to click something on here to? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so uh, I represented the bad guys. Okay, so in, in this three-part war, the people of the city of Detroit, they're not the bad guys. And the pensioners of the city of Detroit, they're not the bad guys. Financial creditors of the city of Detroit, 
we were definitely going to be portrayed as the bad guys. So I was Wall Street in the bankruptcy. And um, I was one of the people that had to sort of stand up to everybody else and say, hey, look, we're also owed money and we need to be treated fairly. And so I was somebody that was often on the receiving end of a fair amount of dissatisfaction from the judges in Detroit. Um, but what we're going to talk about over the next two classes is how did Detroit go from uh, this, just a thriving city, um, thousands of people appearing on a regular basis by ferries and steamers in the city to make a new life. You have a downtown that is full of people. It looks like uh, this, you know, uh, it's a wonderful life. If you've seen that movie, just sort of your iconic, beautiful holiday celebration, beautiful architecture. How does it go from this to this in just five decades, 50 years until you see the ruination of American city? Um, destroyed industrial uh, capacity, blighted neighborhoods uh, filled with vacant homes. And we're going to, I think, try to answer that question in one part of this. How did Detroit rise and why did it decline? And then we're also going to talk about what can you do under the United States Bankruptcy Code if you're a municipality and you find yourself in that position. So I always like to try to give folks a roadmap for where we're going so that you know uh, when we're almost done. Um, and the, uh, the first class, I thought, you know, rather than just diving immediately into the law of bankruptcy, it would be more interesting to understand where did Detroit come from? What happened to it as a municipality? What did that mean? And um, begin to talk about some of the basic premises of bankruptcy generally and municipal bankruptcy specifically, because municipal bankruptcy is very different from corporate bankruptcy, which is where I spent most of my career. And then at the end, we're going to talk about the appointment of an emergency manager in Detroit, which was a precondition to filing for bankruptcy. It was very controversial, and I'll introduce you to that emergency manager. In our second class, we're going to get a bit more technical. So then in the second class, you can't understand a bankruptcy if you don't understand the players. And the players in a bankruptcy are the creditors. And so we're going to talk about the different types of creditors that were all vying to get paid by the city. We're going to talk about whether the city was eligible to file for Chapter 9 protection because eligibility is a legal requirement and there was an enormous fight with the pensions over whether Detroit was even eligible to file for bankruptcy. Excuse me. Then we're going to talk about the grand bargain and the city's plan of adjustment. And for anyone who knows anything about Detroit, the centerpiece of the Detroit bankruptcy was the grand bargain. It relates to the city's art, which we're going to talk to, and was a linchpin of the bankruptcy. And at the end, we'll talk about the confirmation trial. Confirmation is where you establish that the plan that you've put forth, that people have voted on, complies with the bankruptcy code and that you can exit bankruptcy. And what we like to say about bankruptcy is the point of going into bankruptcy is to get out of bankruptcy. And so confirmation is where you prove your case and establish that you can get out and hopefully go on to a brighter future. <clears throat> so with that, let's turn to a brief history of the city of Detroit. Now, one of the things that's remarkable uh, when I dug into this is Detroit was founded in 1701 by Cadillac, largely as a combination military settlement and also fur trading outpost. And the way you can think about the first 150 years of the city of Detroit is that basically very little happened. There weren't really any people. So the main thing that happens to Detroit is that it changes hands. So the Seven Years' War between France and England is fought from 1754 to 1761. The French surrender their North American holdings <clears throat> to the British in 1760. But then 16 years later, the Revolutionary War begins, and in, we all know how that one ends, right, with the Treaty of Paris. And now Detroit comes under the jurisdiction of the United States. 
So the beginning of the 18th century, it was with the French. Then it went to the British. Then it went to the Americans. But it really doesn't matter that it goes to the Americans in 1783 because, of course, there's no Americans there to sort of take it over and run it and do anything with it. In fact, um, uh, it's not until they sign a second treaty 13 years later in 1796, Jay's Treaty, that formal control of Detroit is actually transferred to the Americans. So you have this situation where you have about 2,000 people that are in Detroit. They're mostly French. It's ostensibly under British military control for most of the time, but then legally it's under American jurisdiction. All right. But the, the long way around is that not very much is happening in the city of Detroit between 1700 and 1850. <clears throat> now, there are two things that I want to draw your attention to that I think are going to play a, a critical role in the future development of Detroit. And one of them is right here in 1787, Congress banned slavery in the Northwest Territories. Now, it wasn't necessarily obvious that we weren't going to have slavery in the Northwest Territory. Right. That was a decision that was made. And that's a decision that ends up having a very significant role in the way Detroit develops later. And then second, you're going to see like a little teaser of an explosion to come, which is in 1825, the Erie Canal is completed. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about why that's important. But let's take a look at how Detroit grew over time. So as I said, you know, from 1700 to 1850, after 150 years, you only have about 21,000 people in the city of Detroit. But what you're gonna see from here forward, from 1850 to 1950, is the first part of an absolute convulsion. Within just 100 years, the population of the city of Detroit will be 1.8 million people. Now, I want you to think about that for a second, right? Because we throw these numbers around all the time. Our budget or our deficit or trillions of dollars and jet fighters cost billions of dollars. And after a while, the numbers don't really mean anything. But why don't we go back here and say, okay, they were 21,000 in 1850. What's the population of Holland? Just the city of Holland. The population of the city of Holland is about 34,000 people. Okay, so you can think of yourself as being maybe right around here, 1855, 1860. Within 90 years, there will be 1.8 million people living in Holland if you were to gonna go through this type of population growth. It's like a rocket ship taking off. Now, from 1850 to 1900, you're going to see impressive growth, right? We know as Michiganders, the second part of this story that starts in the early 20th century, right? Everybody knows that story. What about this part of the story? This is tenfold growth going from around 21,000 people in 1850 to over 250,000 in 1900. That's pre-Henry Ford. And uh, it got me thinking, how did we go 10x growth here? We then go 9x growth from 1900 to 1950. And then in the, in the second part of this uh, talk here, we'll talk about how you then shed two thirds of that population in only another 50 years. So just an astonishing accordion-like expansion and then a shocking accordion-like collapse. And I think the three key drivers to this are gonna be our location, and the rise of transportation in the United States of America. Innovation and industrialization, that's the famous part of, this, of the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit. And then racial history and the great migration. So I wanna dwell on each of these briefly if I could. And let's start by talking about the Erie Canal. So it's completed in 1825 and it has revolutionary implications for transportation cost and transportation time. Transportation costs fall by 90%. The time to get somewhere falls by 50%. 
And the result of this is that you now are opening up the interior of the United States of America. So whereas before, I think folks were kind of huddled on the eastern seaboard and kind of migrating slowly to the west, once the Erie Canal is opened, you have total access to the Great Lakes, and Detroit is the gateway to the Great Lakes. So our location at the mouth of the Great Lakes, so that you can cut through the Erie Canal and come up all the way and access all of the Great Lakes, sets off an absolute boom. And this is the first part of our growth. Detroit grows 10 times, as we mentioned, between 1850 and 1900. But the real story of Detroit is about the automobile, right? Industrialization. We start the century with 286,000 people. Detroit is the 13th largest American city. The Ford Motor Company is founded in 1903 and the Model T is introduced in 1908. Um, what people like to say about Ford is that he did not invent the automobile because he didn't, but he did invent the process for making an automobile efficiently. And some of these statistics just are astonishing. So the Model T brought automobiles to the American home of the average American. The average cost was between $260 and $850. By 1920, so in just 12 years, more than half of the registered automobiles in the world were Model Ts. Uh, between 1908 and 1927, when it was retired, Ford sold an astonishing 15 million Model Ts. So we're talking about an absolute revolution. Now, to grow on that scale, you need people. And one of the things that Ford also revolutionized was pay. So in 1914, Ford introduces the $5 workday. And let me just stop for a second and say, if you've ever read about the $5 workday, it's actually totally fascinating the way it worked. It was $2.50 guaranteed. And then $2.50 was subject to sort of moral analysis by the company as to whether you get paid, because Ford had very interesting views about morality. Um, I'll just kind of leave that at that. So um, you also have World War I coming in here in the second part of the teens, which further drives our growth. So let's stop. I think sometimes we get lost in these numbers, right? 286,000 people in 1900. Within two decades, that is shorter than my legal career. <laughs> this city has more than tripled inside. It is now the fourth largest American city. So that is an absolute revolution. You cannot talk about the city of Detroit, though, and its growth without talking about race. And I want to go back to um, here's some pictures of the Model T. Uh, let me, before I get into race, if you've ever read The Reckoning by David Halberstam, which is a sensational book, it's a largely a history of the American automotive industry. It's also a history of how the Japanese um, entered the picture in the second half of the 20th century. It's a terrific book. And he has a, a whole section on what the River Rouge plant, this was an end-to-end -end industrial conglomerate. They had their own smelting capacity. They could do everything inside the River Rouge. It's a modern uh, marvel. And of course, um, one of the amazing parts in the end of the first half of the 20th century is they pivot all of this industrial capacity and they begin making tanks and bombers. So you see the amazing flexibility of American capitalism. But I want to dwell on the Great Migration and the notion of race in Detroit, because you cannot talk about Detroit without talking about race. It's meaningless. And I want to go back to this point that slavery was outlawed in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. What that meant was we didn't have slavery north uh, of the Mason-Dixon line in the United States of America. Now, that becomes significant, right? Because number one, there are slaves that are escaping from the South during the time of slavery. Detroit is the last stop on the Underground Railroad, where the place that you jumped over to Canada from. So there's already sort of a working familiarity with the idea of going to Detroit. It wasn't the only place you could go. But certainly, Black folk in the South had heard of this idea of trying to get to Detroit and then to Canada. But... Um, more importantly than that, when you have a you have southern slaveholding states, you fight you fight a civil war to end slavery. 
and you have the the enormous racism of the culture of the South. There's certainly racism in the North too, but you have institutionalized racism in the South that is literally part of the law. There is going to come a point at which Black folk in the South don't want to live in the South anymore. And that didn't happen immediately after the Civil War. There was a period of about five decades where, understandably, former slaves were now sort of frozen in place. But starting in 1910, you see this absolute exodus from the South. And that has enormous, enormous economic implications for the development of the United States of America. And the beneficiary of a lot of that migration internally are the non-slaveholding states that had never embraced slavery. So it's sort of a simple point. It's very intuitive. But when Black folk in this country decided that they wanted to get away from a culture that had endorsed slavery, they went north. Six million people left the South. Uh, after the end of slavery and after the end of the, the age of terror in the South, Detroit was a beneficiary of a lot of that internal migration. So as we were showing, in order to have economic development, you need people. We saw the, all the growth in the city of uh, Detroit, and we're going to look later about what that meant for the racial diversity in the city of Detroit, how that plays both a positive role in its growth and an important role in its decline and in the politics of Detroit. All right, so let's consider Detroit at its peak. What I cannot get over about the city of Detroit is it was the Silicon Valley of its era. It had the highest per capita income in the United States. One sixth of US jobs in the entire country were directly or indirectly a result of the city of Detroit. It was an incredibly racially diverse city, and it was so wealthy that it would actually, its city council would commission art buying trips to Europe. So they would give people money from the city's coffers, and they would go to Europe, and they would buy art. Now, to those of us living in Michigan today, that is unfathomable, right? But if I told you that maybe in San Francisco today that they were doing stuff like that, which I don't know if they are or they aren't. You could fathom that, right? We know what it means today to be Silicon Valley, and we know what it means to not be Silicon Valley. When you're thinking about Detroit back in this time period, it was Silicon Valley of the United States of America. We were an industrial country, and the wealth was right here in the state of Michigan over on the, on the eastern side of the state. Now, I have to get into the art because the art is the big story of the city of Detroit bankruptcy, and you're going to understand a lot about this uh, more later. But I also think it's just sort of amazing to stop and think about uh, some of the pieces there. So this is the famous, this is the most valuable piece in the city of Detroit's bank, uh, Art Institute, the wedding dance by Peter Bruegel, the elder. The estimated value, this is 10 years ago, it was $200 million dollars. No one really knows how much this piece of art is worth. It's by a great master. Um, there are estimates that it could be worth a billion dollars. And this is sitting in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Someone was smart enough to uh, pick up Van Gogh's self-portrait with a straw hat. I know I would pay $150 million for that. Um, uh, really remarkable. And, and obviously in the bankruptcy, Creditors who were looking around at a destitute city, looking for assets that maybe we could get paid for. One of the things we wanted to do was get a sense of how much the art was worth. So there were valuations done. And I put up pick, uh, this slide here so that you can get a sense of what we're talking about. There was big money in the city's art collection. Now, you're probably wondering a little bit, hmm, I don't understand like what the art has to do with the city. Uh, Chicago has an art institute. It's a world-class art institute. No one talks about taking Chicago, Chicago's art, but there's a key legal difference. In Chicago, the art in the uh, art institute has always been in a trust. Okay, It's always been in a trust that is entirely separate from the city of Chicago. Detroit owned its art. The city did. There was no separate trust set up for many, many years. So you had a true anomaly, which is all of this art was actually owned by the city. And when I say all of this art, I'm saying the city's estimate of the art was that it was worth about $2 billion. 
the financial creditors, probably litigation driven estimates were that it was worth eight. I think it's fairly, uh, it was reasonable to assume that it was worth between three and $5 billion. And this was a flashpoint in the bankruptcy. Okay. People, there were a lot of opinions on this and I, I really do intend to leave time at the end of our second class. So I want to give you all the opportunity to talk about what you think about it. Everyone's got an opinion on the art. I will tell you this though, having gone to Detroit over and over and over to handle these hearings and argue in court, you know, Detroit is not a nice place to visit. It has a very nice uh, kind of downtown that's very small. I think they call it the 7.3 miles. And then the, the rest of it isn't nice at all. And you didn't feel safe really even kind of walking to court. I once went to a convenience store that was just up the street uh, from my hotel. And there were these guys outside kind of engaged in this conversation. There were three gentlemen ringed around this one very large individual. And he kept reaching in his pants and fiddling with himself like this. And I went in to get some gum or whatever I was there for. And then I came out and the three gentlemen had left. And I said to the guy, what was going on? He said, those three guys are going to rob me. And I was pretending that trying to create the image that I had a gun. So they weren't sure. And they didn't. It worked. This was one block away from the Weston Hotel. It's two blocks away from the courthouse. Okay. So when you're in a place that's this destitute and I tell you, hey, by the way, there's $5 billion sitting in a building just four blocks from here. It definitely creates a sense in your mind of, is that a good way for us to go about doing things here in the city of Detroit? And that would be a centerpiece of the bankruptcy. We'll talk a lot about that in the second part of our class. Is it in a trust now? What's that? It's the heart of the trust It now. is. <laughs> I will. And I, I'm supposed to remind folks that uh, questions are absolutely welcome. So please stop me and ask questions anytime you want. However, we have to give you the microphone. And that's so the folks that are watching on Zoom can hear. But we're going to come back to that because that's not only of huge significance during the case. It's of huge significance now that the city is struggling in the post-COVID world because nobody's going downtown anymore and not just in Detroit. Okay, so we talked about the fun part, the meteoric growth of the city of Detroit in this 100 year period between 1850 and 1950. We talked about location and transportation, industrialization, innovation, and the great migration. But now we gotta talk about the back half of the curve. And this is kind of the sad part, right? So in just five decades, I'm born right in here. And by here, look at where this city is. So it goes from a peak in, 1950 of 1.85 million by 1900 uh, sorry by 2000 we're under a million and by the time the city is getting ready to file um, that number I think is is uh, about consistent they were down to 677,000 so you are talking about now a convulsive a negative convulsion a decrease of two-thirds of the population of the city and listen to this statistic that I found the other day. Between 2000 and 2010, uh, which you'll remember is the Great Recession, largely, the last two years of it, um, Detroit loses 25% of its population. And that is the largest population loss in a decade for any city over 100,000 people in American history, with one exception. And that exception is the people leaving New Orleans after Katrina. Okay, so I just want you to stop because we get all these statistics and it's sort of like, ah, this stat, that stat, but think about this. You are already on the back end of five decades of terrible decline in the city. It's 2000, you've already seen massive decline. From going forward from this day, the city is still going to, to realize the worst urban drop in American history, the only exception being one of the worst hurricanes to ever hit United uh, major American city. That's what Detroit was experiencing, except it wasn't a hurricane, right? It wasn't an acute event. It's the chronic um, effects of disinvestment in flight. So the question is, what caused the decline? We talked about what caused the growth, but what are the key causes of the decline? So the principal causes of the decline just as industrialization and innovation are a key part of the growth, 
deindustrialization is a key part of the decline. You have racial strife and white flight, which plays a central role in the political and economic history of the city of Detroit. And then kind of riding along with deindustrialization, you have now competition in the automotive industry from Japan. I just got done reading a book called Embracing Defeat, which is a story of how the United States uh, uh, reconstructed Japan in the aftermath of World War II. It is a fascinating book. And I think if you look at how destitute Japan was between 1945 and 1952, it had, after all, had two atomic bombs dropped on it. For them, within 25 years, to be rivaling the United States of America and the automotive industry is one of the most astonishing revolutions um, you'll see in economics. Just stunning. And now we start to see the bad side of migration, right? We see the reverse migration because a lot of those Southern states did not have the type of strong labor movement that the, the North did. And as a result, there were lower, there was less union penetration in the South. And what do you see? You see the auto manufacturers first decentralizing their, op their operations out of the city into the suburbs and in other parts of Michigan, like uh, Flint and even my hometown of Lansing. And then you see them transitioning down into the south and now eventually you know you're going to go overseas right so you're seeing this classic economic search for lower cost labor and it moves industrial capacity away from the city and here are some of the key events you know part of this is that uh, you know the surge that led to 1950 was in part on the back of world war ii which is this like absolute seismic economic event for the united states it's what establishes us as the world superpower you're going to, there's going to be some retrenchment after that, right? So there were 150,000 jobs lost in the post-war economy. Uh, 1967, you have race riots that really start to change the tenor of the city of Detroit. And then this is a big moment. This is the year of my birth, 1971, and Milliken v. Bradley. Now, Milliken v. Bradley will ultimately be reversed by the United States Supreme Court. But what it was at the time was it was an effort to implement the teachings of Brown v. Board of Education, right? So Brown v. Board of Education from the mid-1950s says you cannot discriminate in education against Black students by having separate but equal schools. Problem, we'd all been locked into residential arrangements where even if you didn't have de jure segregation by law, meaning laws that forbid Black youth from going to white schools, and you open them up to everybody, well, we do schools by residence. So the schools all ended up being uh, segregated anyway because people live near the schools they went to. So the first idea was, well, we're going to use busing to try to integrate the schools because diversity is important. It's important that we go to school together. And the result to that was folks that had economic mobility, mainly white people, moved further away. So the judge in Milliken v. Bradley was confronting a situation where people had moved so far away that he had to order a absolutely revolutionary injunctive relief in the form of busing plans that were going to have these kids on the buses for as much as four hours a day, two hours to school, two hours back at enormous cost, but in the name of trying to have integrated schools, right? He thought he was implementing the spirit of Brown v. Board. And the Supreme Court finally said, enough is enough. There are limits to the injunctive power of courts to try to remedy historical discrimination. But this was just more incentive for people to move further away. If you were a white person and you didn't want your kid to go to a, a school with black people or a school that you perceived as less, uh, less good than it should be, what your goal was, was to move as far away. So you see white people fleeing the city of Detroit. And this is all about economic mobility, right? Because the people that can move in that situation are going to be the middle and the upper class people, right? So as those folks move, you start seeing depressed real estate value. You depress the real estate value of a city. Now you're depressing the tax basis of the city, right? That's where the city gets its revenue. So these things all start to work together in a bad way. And you have other extrinsic events, right? You have the Arab oil embargo. That was not fun. I'm sure a lot of folks here actually remember that. Um, that's not a commentary on the age of Haas participants, but uh, it might be true nonetheless. Um, 
And then you have this shock of Japan surpassing the United States in global auto production. I can actually remember that as a kid growing up in Michigan. Um, when these small Japanese cars began to appear on the market and they were much more fuel efficient and people actually began to buy, buy them, including people in Michigan, where we always bought, we always bought Detroit, Michigan. So these are some of the key events in, in, in the decline. And, and this is what it looks like. Um, there was a day that I was going in for court in Detroit and there were torrential rain, there was torrential rain and it flooded all the highways. So I couldn't get from the airport downtown and I had to stay in one of the suburbs in a hotel that I got that night. And then the next day I had to take a cab in and the cab couldn't go on the highway. So we had to kind of go by the back roads. I went through a lot of these neighborhoods and it was absolutely stunning to see. I remember, uh, you know how when you go onto a porch and there will be like a little mini roof just over the porch. I saw one house where that whole thing had just fallen onto the porch and was sitting there. So you couldn't have gone through the front door if you wanted to. I saw another house, so there was a tree growing through it. Okay, so we're not talking about houses that were only blighted for a year. We're talking about blight that had existed for decades, long enough for trees to grow up through the middle of it. This created a huge um, civic management problem in the city of Detroit, because you have this explosive growth that we've been over, you have enough space for 1.8 million people, then you take out two thirds of the people. And it created what we call a checkerboard problem. So the checkerboard problem was that you might have a block of houses with maybe four of the 20 being, being inhabited. And so the city had to provide services, had to provide police, fire, water, lighting, all the infrastructure that goes into a city. You had to, you had to provide them to a footprint for a million eight that was only one third full. And it made it very difficult and expensive for the city of Detroit to, provide, to try and provide uh, services. Now, the other thing that is um, impossible to ignore here is uh, the change in Detroit demographically. So we all know Detroit is a black city, right? But look at this, 1970, Detroit is still majority Caucasian. And in fact, in 1975, it's about 50-50. So it's still a very, very diverse city, probably one of the most diverse cities in the United States of America but it is on like a very different path from where it came from. Okay, so by, uh, let's see, I have the statistics here. By 1980, Detroit is now two thirds African-American. By 2000, Detroit is over 90% African-American. And this has critical implications for the nature of the city, right? The first point is this lower tax base. So economically mobile people have left. Okay, all that money is left to your city. And then the second part of this is there's going to be political implications as well, right? You have a highly concentrated group of black folk that are in this one city. I'm sure, they have their representatives, but they're not going to be able to carry a vote in the Michigan State Legislature. And something happens in 1998 that's very important, that's kind of in the weeds that I want to talk about for a second here. And that is um, the way the state of Michigan approached revenue sharing. So up until this point, Detroit had a city income tax. Cities were allowed to have a city income tax and Detroit's was the highest in the state. It was 3% for residents and it was one and a half percent for commuters. It wasn't the only city that had a city income tax, but it needed additional revenue on top of its property tax base to try to make everything go. <clears throat> Governor Engler in 1998, uh, was a Republican governor who was an anti-tax conservative and thought it'd be better for the state of Michigan, better for our cities if we had lower taxes. So he went to Dennis Archer in 1998 and they cut a handshake deal and the deal went like this. Detroit would cut its income taxes from 3% down to 2%. So you're talking about a 33% reduction in your city income tax. That's a lot of money for the city. So Archer, Mayor Archer was obviously like, well, if we're going to go through this level of cutting, how are we going to make up for the funding? And what Engler said was, 
we will have state revenue sharing for the state sales tax that we will distribute out to all the municipalities. And there were more municipalities in Detroit that were concerned about this, but the deal was cut your city income taxes. The state legislature will cut them to a new cap, but we'll supplement the lost revenue with revenue sharing out of our sales tax collections every year. And the deal was it was going to be $333 million a year um, back when they cut the deal in 98. And that's what it was for a few years until the state of Michigan began having budget problems of its own. And so there's a very key moment that happens here, which is the state of Michigan decided to balance its budget by cutting revenue sharing to cities like Detroit. And as a result, um, the state goes back on its word with respect to this handshake deal. And this is not a legally operable deal. Okay, this wasn't enshrined in statute. This was an understanding by people as part of a political process. So couldn't bring a lawsuit, but uh, it was definitely a material change in circumstances. The estimates are that between 2003 and 2013, the state ultimately raids what should have been revenue sharing for Detroit to the tune of about 732 million. And Detroit's not the only municipality that has to go through this. During that same period, Grand Rapids loses $73 million in anticipated revenue sharing. But I want you to keep that number in mind. $732 million is the consensus estimate of what Detroit should have gotten between 2003 and 2013. So let's go back to 2013, which is the year the city's gonna file for bankruptcy. It is not a pretty picture. So you have a 63% decline from 1950, you have 18.3% unemployment. Um, I think during the during the Great Depression, the unemployment rate in the United States got as high as 25%. And you'll remember that a result of that, right, was the Red Scare and serious flirtation on the part of the political United States with the idea of socialism and communism, right? That was a result of having 25% unemployment. Detroit has 18.3% unemployment. Little known fact, as impoverished as Detroit is, the more impoverished you become, the more your taxes are a burden on you. They have the highest per, per capita tax burden in the, in the state of Michigan. So it's the poorest city, highest per capita taxes. Highest violent crime rate of any city over 200,000 in the United States of America. So you're paying more in taxes per capita than anyone else in Michigan. And, in, and your return on that is that you have the highest crime rate in the entire country. 40% um, uh, of the city's streetlights do not work at the time of the bankruptcy. And there are a stunning 78,000 abandoned and blighted structures. Uh, so again, lots of numbers. What do they mean? So there are 34,000 people in Holland, Michigan proper. And I want you to imagine if we took every single one of those people and for each of them, there were more than two abandoned buildings for them, right? They're everywhere. And they are what turn into crack houses. They are where arsons occur, right? They are an absolute menace to public safety in Detroit. I'll tell you a brief uh, funny story. It's largely funny because it is not about me. It's about a young guy that worked for me named Bill Arnault. But early on in the bankruptcy, the city wanted to appropriately take steps to fix the lights. And there was a special program from the state where the city could pledge assets and get access to a $140 million loan that was fully secured that they would be able to pay back, but it was at a very favorable interest rate good deal for the city and they could use it to fix the lights. Now, everyone knew that you're going to have to fix the lights in the city of Detroit. You can't have half of the street lights out and have a safe city. But on behalf of financial creditors, we put our hands up and said, there is all sorts of stuff that should and will happen to this city. However, it should happen at the end when we know who's getting what and how much stuff you have to give us because you owe us a lot of money. My clients were owed $1.4 billion. 
So we said, we're not saying don't fix the lights. We're just saying, let's put this proposed solution to the light problem into the larger mix of our negotiations and the plan of adjustment and the holistic approach that's going to be had here, because there's going to have to be some sort of balancing between the city's go forward budget, the provision of municipal services, funding for police and fire, payment of the pensions, payment for the Wall Street creditors, like this is all got to fit together. If you just run off right now at the start of the bankruptcy and give away 140 million in assets to fix the lights, you're kind of making a decision before we know how this all works together. Very controversial hearing. So I was the one that was going to handle that hearing because I'm the big boy in this relationship. So when you have hearings like this one that are going to be very unpopular, those are the ones that I handle. I could not handle this hearing because they needed to send me to New York to negotiate with bondholders and tell the bondholders they should all take a discount on their bonds because my client was going to go bankrupt because we didn't have any money for him. So I was going to go, now I had to go to New York and scare the bondholders and tell them how screwed we were and how they should take a discount. So I sent my Lieutenant Billy Arnault to uh, argue the lighting motion. And the next day I woke up <laughs> And the newspaper said, attorney for Sincora, that was our client, says they are in the dark on lighting motion. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and called Billy and said, what happened yesterday in court? And he said, our principal argument in court had been, this is too early. You have to make this part of a holistic solution. And also, we haven't been given any discovery on this. We don't even know what this is. So we haven't been given any information about the city. And when Billy was arguing the motion, he grabbed for a very common metaphor that you use when you haven't been given access to discovery. And he said, we are in the dark. <laughs> and the bankruptcy judge who was very smart and did not pass up an opportunity to make us look bad said, can you repeat that? <laughs> and he said, we're in the dark. He was very nervous. This was his first big motion. So I'm like, this is like going from playing baseball and sort of like the local church league to now playing center field for the Yankees and trying to have your first at bat. And the judge just rips into him. He's like, you're not in the dark. The people of the city of Detroit are in the dark because the streetlights aren't on. And that's what they're trying to fix with this motion. So that was a tough uh Tough introduction to uh, arguing stuff for good old Billy, but anyway, um, these are these are shocking numbers. And one of the problems that happens here, right, is as the tax base declines, you start running deficits. Okay, and when you run deficits, you have to borrow money to fund the deficits. So uh, you have these growing budget deficits. And the city is borrowing money. So these LTGO series are bond offerings. So these are limited tax, general obligation bond offerings that they're doing. And they're doing 75 million in 2008, and then 250 in 2010, and 2012, they're doing 130. But the key stat here that I want to draw your attention to is the accumulated deficit by 2013 is $700 million. Does that number sound familiar, right? That's the amount of money that the state took from the revenue sharing. Now, I don't want to go too far with that point because even if you gave Detroit another $700 million and it didn't have an operating budget deficit for these 10 years, it was still up a creek, okay? It had billions in liabilities it could not pay. It was not funding healthcare costs for retirees. That was $4 billion right there in future expenses. Its pensions were underfunded to the tune of $2 billion. So I don't want to take this point too far. I'm just saying that while there were state politicians in Lansing who were looking good with balancing the state of Michigan's budget, there were implications for cities around the state. And when your state laws bar Detroit from raising its city income tax to try to fund operations, you're not leaving it with a lot of tools. Okay, so... Um, that is kind of the story of how Detroit rises, why it falls, and what it means for the city. It was, it was a dire place to be. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about what you do in that circumstance. We're going to talk about how the bankruptcy code, in theory, can help you. 
So I've tried to strike an appropriate level of generality with this. I, I like to give people enough knowledge of something that they can have a sense they understand it. I don't want you to have to actually attend law school to understand this. So we'll see if I struck this balance appropriately. But I do want to, I want to talk about some of the key parts of bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a very confusing topic to a lot of people. Okay. But the, the first point that I want you to remember about bankruptcy is just because you're bankrupt doesn't mean that you don't have any money. Okay. The bankrupt companies that I worked on restructuring during my career were fabulously valuable. Okay. One of the last big bankruptcies that I worked on, I was a lead litigation counsel in the iHeart bankruptcy. iHeart was worth about $10 billion when it filed for bankruptcy. Okay. So you can be worth $10 billion. You file for bankruptcy because you owe $20 billion. Okay. So bankruptcy is about figuring out how we should equitably distribute what you've got now that it's clear that you can't pay everybody off. Okay. So it's trying to maximize what you have and give as much of it as you can to your creditors, acknowledging that you probably won't be able to give them everything. Okay. So point number one is just because you're bankrupt doesn't mean you're penniless. There are a lot of reasons that people file for bankruptcy. For example, Take one of the first big corporate bankruptcies in American history, John's Manville. They were a very healthy company. They sold insulation and a number of different building products, but there was a problem, which is that they had historically sold asbestos products. And they started seeing lawsuits. And by lawsuits, I mean tens of thousands of lawsuits in every single jurisdiction in the United States, mainly on the Eastern seaboard and a lot of the shipbuilding towns. So you get to a point where even though you have this profitable business, it's selling stuff, it's it's uh, making money, you're starting to get bogged down just litigating all of these different lawsuits. And there came a point in the early 80s where John's Manville just threw up its hands and said, let's go into bankruptcy court, we'll gather all of these lawsuits, all of the creditors that claim owe us money, we'll bring them to a centralized place, and we will organize their claims there. We can, they can assert them, we can decide which ones are good, which ones aren't, how much we owe, how much we're worth, and then we'll give that company to our creditors and go forth with now an appropriate capital structure and appropriate amount of debt. So that's one reason people file for bankruptcy. Another reason people file for bankruptcy is technological change. So you take iHeart. iHeart was big in outdoor advertising, billboards at Clear Channel, and radio advertising. How many people here listen to the radio? Maybe a few. I haven't listened to the radio in, I don't know, 10 years, right? I stream podcasts. I get them through my iPhone, Apple TV. So there was a revolution in the technological way we deliver advertising that did not work for iHeart's business that depressed the amount of money that iHeart could get. There are a lot of, I spent a lot of times down in, Texas restructuring companies in the oil patch, right? Because oil is at a certain price. You borrow money based on the amount of uh, the price per barrel of oil, because that tells you how much revenue you can get. That tells you how much debt you can service. The more debt you can get, the more you can explore for oil. All works fine until they invent fracking. Fracking unleashes an absolute tsunami of natural gas and oil, like stunning. Um, how much oil and natural gas was still in the United States in all of this rock that you just needed to fracture in the right way. Price of oil plummets, and now your capital structure, all that debt that you took on, does not work with the price per barrel of oil. So the revenue that you're getting in cannot service the debt that you took, right? So you didn't necessarily do anything bad per se. The world changes, and sometimes the way your business is, is out of step with technological innovation. Everyone's heard of Enron, right? Enron's the other type of bankruptcy. You go around and lie to people and you say, we're worth X. They lend you money. Then it comes out, you're worth one-tenth of X, okay? That's the fraud-driven bankruptcy where now you have a capital structure that was built on lies. The reality is down here. So everyone needs to go into bankruptcy court and figure out who gets what. So just because you're bankrupt doesn't mean you're penniless. Second key point. This is my favorite thing about bankruptcy. So please remember this one too. 
bankruptcies are little democracies, okay? When you go into bankruptcy, you have to come up with a plan for how you're going to pay everybody out, pay, pay everybody off, okay? You want to restructure. All of the companies that I work on are more valuable as operating businesses. It's very rare that we just liquidate a company and then hand out the cash. You want to keep them going. So um, you have to have a plan. So you have a plan, you have projections for what you think you can make, and then you submit that plan. And the only way you get out of bankruptcy is if your creditors put their hands up and vote in favor of your plan. You can't just go to people and say, I feel like giving you a quarter. And if they say, that doesn't seem very fair, then just do it to them anyway. You have to persuade them that that's all that you can give them, that that's the best that you can do. So bankruptcies are about democracies. The creditors vote. Now, think about that for a second for class two when we come back together for the city of Detroit, right? Because what's the largest class of people out there? It's those pensioners. And they're all going to have to vote on this plan and have to approve it. So bankruptcies are about democracy. Don't forget that. It's a little mini democracy. And then there are also rules for the plan that you propose. So even if you propose a plan that your little democracy votes in favor of, there are certain rules that you have to meet nonetheless. So for example, there is a rule called the absolute priority rule. You have to pay creditors in order of priority. So we'll try not to get too technical, but I think folks here may have some understanding of the difference between a secured creditor and an unsecured creditor. When you buy a house and you go to the bank and borrow 80% of the down payment for your house, the bank gives you a more gets a mortgage from you, right? They now have a security interest in your house. You can't just go sell your house to your neighbor, right? Because the bank will say, no, 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 no one's selling this house till I get my money and your neighbor's not going to buy it because if they do, it's going to come with a mortgage of 80% of the debt on it. That's a secured creditor. If I run into my friend Bob on the street and I say, I will pay you $10 next week and I don't, that's an unsecured debt, okay? Secured creditors come first. Unsecured creditors come second. So when you are going through your plan, you have to pay the secured creditors first, then the unsecured creditors get whatever's left over. And in theory, equity, the owners of the company, they get whatever's uh, left if you pay all your unsecured creditors, which sometimes happens. So one of the last things I did in my career at Kirkland was, I was involved in the world's most astonishing auction for Hertz, where Hertz was ultimately sold to my client. We won the auction and we paid enough money for Hertz that we paid off all the secured debt, all the unsecured debt, and even the old equity holders of Hertz got money from the sale of Hertz. So you can go into bankruptcy. Hertz, of course, went into bankruptcy because of the COVID pandemic. Nobody was traveling. Nobody's renting cars. So it was at Nadir. It couldn't service its debt. Had to go in and file bankruptcy. Then all of a sudden, everybody starts running around going bananas again as soon as they can. And, and now Hertz's revenues are on the upswing and they have a bright perceived future. And the company sold for more than its debts. So equity got a return in the Hertz bankruptcy. One of the most astonishing uh, things I've ever been involved in. Now, Second concept of democracy, right? What's the most important principle of democracy that we usually observe only in the breach? Equal protection, okay? The number one risk in a democracy is that the majority will oppress a minority group, right? So you have to have equal protection of law to ensure that doesn't happen. So if you make your laws apply broadly, that has a way of making sure that majorities don't pass laws that they don't like because it'll apply to them too. Okay, so that's how equal protection works in our constitutional scheme. There's an equal protection concept in the bankruptcy code. You have to treat similar creditors similarly. So I can't go out and buy the votes that I need to get for my plan by giving all my buddies a bunch of extra recovery and then screwing over a minority group and then saying, hey, look, everybody vote in favor of it, right? Can't do that. Got to treat creditors similarly situated. Creditors have to be treated similarly. Remember that concept, okay? Because in class two, I'll give you one guess as to whether the city decided to treat financial creditors like me similarly to pensioners, okay? 
I'll try not to give away the ending on that one. <laughs> so principle number one, got to pay people in order. Principle number two, got to treat people, uh, similar people similarly. Principle number three, the bankruptcy has to be worth the candle. Okay, so you have to show that the reorganized company, and this is in the chapter 11 context, this is corporate bankruptcy. You have to show that what every single creditor gets in a reorganization is not less than they would get if we just liquidated and sold it all off. This is my other favorite thing about the bankruptcy code. You have to prove that this company remains viable. So if I say, hey, look, it's so great. We're going to reorganize the Steve Hackney Widget Corporation. And we're going to come out of bankruptcy and I'm going to keep making my widgets that everyone loves the Steve Hackney widgets. And everyone's going to get 10 cents on the dollar. If any creditor puts their hand up and says, wait a second, if you just sold all the plants and you sold all the real estate and the office buildings, we would get 15 cents on the dollar. Then my plan doesn't work and you got to liquidate. So there's a proof in the bankruptcy code that requires that you actually work as a reorganized entity, that you have continuing vitality that exceeds what people would get if we just shut you down and liquidated you. Remember that concept as well, because you can't liquidate a city. Okay, so the way that test works in the context of a municipal bankruptcy is very different than it works in the context of a corporation. You can't sell a city. And then the last point that's going to have, I think, growing significance in the years ahead, if what I'm hearing is true, is the idea that your plan has to be feasible. You must propose a plan that will work and that won't lead you to file for bankruptcy again soon after the one you've just exited. And um, that's an institutional concern of the bankruptcy code uh, and the bankruptcy court system. So we don't want someone to come in and say, hey, I owe people $9 billion, but I think I'm worth $8 billion, So I'm going to just cut the debt down to $8 billion and give everybody eight-ninths and go on my way. And then, oh, that didn't work, actually. I wasn't worth eight. So then you come back the next year and say, okay, everybody, I owe everybody eight. We're going to try seven. So I think I'm worth seven. So I'll give everybody seven eights and we'll try this second bankruptcy. That's called a chapter 22. And then, oh, that didn't work. And now you're back again the next year to try another little haircut. We want you to handle your business and be done. And we don't want you to come back into bankruptcy. Now, this is the concept of feasibility. You must prove that your plan will yield a feasible entity and that you won't be coming back to the bankruptcy court anytime soon. So you got to make sure you cut enough. And this is going to be additionally significant because the creditors don't really care whether or not you're going to be coming back or not. They don't care if the United States court system doesn't like dealing with multiple bankruptcies. They just want their money. So if you're proposing eight, eight ninths recovery and it's on a very rosy valuation, that sounds good to me. So the bankruptcy court is the one that's got to really watch and say, wait a second, wait a second. I think this valuation of $8 billion is garbage. I think you guys are all getting together and like using nitrous oxide and having happy moments about how valuable you are. I think this company is worth $5 billion. We need to come to terms with the harsh cuts that need to be made. That point is very significant because in the Detroit bankruptcy, you had the same dynamic. Okay, the pensioners are going to get this, others are going to get this. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, the city's viable, it's feasible, don't worry, it'll be fine. The only person watching that question in that scenario was the court. And if you go in the newspapers today and take a look at what's going on in Detroit, you may see that there are now ongoing questions about the city's feasibility because it can't make a lot of its payments because there has been a 50% reduction in the number of people that are going into downtown Detroit. So um, those are some of the key principles of bankruptcy I want to get into before we get to some of this more technical stuff. Bankruptcy doesn't mean you're penniless. Bankruptcies are democracies, but there are certain rules to bankruptcies that you have to comply with before you can get out. So 
Um, this is a, so, sort of a, a key element of uh, chapter 11, sort of the highlights. And I put all this there in case folks want a copy of the presentation, you'll have some of the more technical points. When we go into chapter 11, it's obviously a court supervised restructuring. Everything runs now through the bankruptcy court. One thing that folks often don't understand is that management and the board stay in control of the company. Okay. It's very rare that you have a trustee appointed. I don't know if any of you followed the recent crypto bankruptcy of FTX. That was a massive fraud scheme. The first thing they appointed there was a trustee and the trustee was from Enron. Last great example of a fraudulent bankruptcy. <laughs> um, so in all of the cases that I've handled, the same people that decide to file for bankruptcy, they keep running the company afterwards. Why is that? because you want the people that know how to run the company to keep running the company so that they can make as much money for you as possible. In general, these companies are not liquidated. They are worth more operating than they are in liquidation. So we try to reorganize them, keep them running, and then give everyone a new stake. So the company will emerge with lower debt, a different equity ownership structure. A lot of times you're restructuring your secured debt to a lower amount and then giving all the equity to your unsecured debt and they become the new owners of the company and the old equity holders are blown out. Um, there are a bunch of things that you can do in bankruptcy to improve, so improve the company. So one of the things you do is you take all the contracts of the company and you line them up and all the bad contracts that you signed that you shouldn't have, you reject them. So you say, I shouldn't have signed that contract with you. That was too good a deal for you, bad deal for me. I reject your contract and now you have a breach of contract claim and you're now a creditor in my bankruptcy. The idea here is to develop a healthy entity that can compete. We don't want to exit in con uh, bankruptcy with a bunch of bad contracts. That's why it's in bankruptcy in the first place. So let's get all the pain out, reject the bad contracts, figure out what you're worth. The folks that are on the other side of those contracts, they're now creditors. They'll probably get unsecured recoveries of pennies on the dollar, but that's better than having you exit bankruptcy with a bad contract. And then here's the goal is a plan of reorganization, which is going to decide how everyone is handled. You can also seek operational changes. There are times in bankruptcy where companies will say, we should not have gotten into this business line and we are going to exit it. It's just not a good idea. And bankruptcy creates what we often call a breathing spell for a fresh start for you to reconsider a lot of these things. This is what the timeline typically looks like. So you spend a bunch of time preparing and you file. This is a big day. So when you file, you have what's called the first day hearing, which is everyone shows up in court. You usually file at like 12.01 a.m. So you wait for midnight and then you file. As soon as midnight passes, you start filing. And they file an ocean of stuff in the on the bankruptcy court docket. And then you usually show up in court that day or maybe the next day. And there are a number of emergency motions the bankruptcy court has to handle because it's now overseeing this company that may be worth billions of dollars that is suddenly in its courtroom and everything has to run through it. So you stabilize the company, you start figuring out a business plan and you figure out what, what parts of the business you wanna get rid of, what are all those bad contracts we should get rid of. And then you negotiate a plan with your creditors. Remember when we talked about bankruptcy as a democracy, this is where I'm going to tell everybody, here's what I propose that everybody's going to get, and I got to go round up the votes. I put it all in a disclosure statement. One bankruptcy judge I know said, the only thing people care about bankruptcy is what am I going to get? Well, the disclosure statement tells you, here's what everybody's going to get. Here's the new structure that we're emerging with. The creditors hopefully vote to approve it. And then remember that part I told you about which said, even if you satisfy the democracy, you still have to satisfy those elements. That's where the court confirms your plan and then you exit. This is, the, um, uh, this is some of the parts of a plan of reorganization. It talks about who's going to get what, what's the currency? Will old equity holders get any recovery? Sometimes they actually do like in the Hertz bankruptcy. What will the company's new corporate structure and more importantly, its capital structure look like? How much debt will it have? It went in with $4 billion in secured debt. We know it can't handle that. It's coming out with $2 billion in secured debt. That's capital structure. It talks about those contracts that I kept and how they're going to be handled. 
what I need to do to bring them up to date. It talks about all the folks whose contracts I rejected and how they're going to be handled. And then what it does is it discharges all the debts at that point. Okay, so we've gathered everybody up into one court. We've said, who's got a grievance with this company? Everybody's put their hands up. We've decided how everybody's going to be treated them. And that's it. Okay, there's now a discharge of your debts. So we don't want companies going through bankruptcy. And then two years later, having somebody show up and go, hey, you owe me 10 bucks for that thing that you said you'd do for me five years ago. I was like, no, we published notice of our bankruptcy in every paper in the country. We serve notice on all of our creditors. If you said that I owed you money, you needed to show up, file a proof of claim, vote on the plan, and tell me what your issues were. And if you didn't, you are out of luck forever because I discharged all of my debts. They're all going to be handled through the plan now. And then this is the voting eligibility stuff. I, this is the bankruptcy is democracy part. I love this part. Okay. So what happens is you have to get at least 50% of the claimants by number and you have to get two thirds by dollar. Okay. So if I have a million dollars in bonds and everybody owns a $1 bond, I got to get 500,000 people to vote in favor. And the bonds that they own have to be worth at least $667,000, okay? So we want to make sure that we've got real heft behind voting on this plan. You wouldn't want a situation, right, where you have a billion dollars in bonds, um, and I go find the, that are held by, say, 20, you know, 20 people. 10 people own a million dollars in bonds, so I go get those guys. And then they all vote in favor of the plan. I say, I've got 50%. And it's like, yeah, you've got 50% of the number of bondholders, but you've got a tiny fraction of the amount of the debt. So it's not just the number of people are voting, it's how much do they have. Um, and then the other key thing that's interesting about who gets to vote is the way you get to vote in bankruptcy is it's a question of whether you're impaired or not, okay? So if I am paying you in full, you don't get to vote. Like we don't want all the people that are getting paid in full to come in and say that they love the plan. We know they love the plan. <laughs> and if I'm paying you zero, you don't get to vote either because we assume you don't like the plan. Okay. So we know that you're going to vote to reject this plan because you're not getting anything. So we'll, we solve for that with the legal requirements that require a proof that I don't have anything to give you. It's all the people out there that are getting something less than they're owed, but something more than zero that are impaired. Those are the folks that get to vote. So only people that are impaired get to vote. Uh, um, and then there's some other technical stuff here that we don't need to get into. And, and these are some of those other tests that I was talking about. So that best interest test, that's the worth the candle test. You ever heard that phrase worth the candle? It's the question of whether the poker game is worth the candle. So if a candle costs 25 cents and you guys are sitting there betting a penny, somebody says, wait, I don't know if we should even burn the candle down because the poker game's only got a couple cents going back and forth and the candle costs 25 cents. So let's save the candle. So is the game worth the candle is where that saying comes from. Same concept here with the best interest test. Is it actually in everyone's best interest that we reorganize this company or should we just shut it down and sell it? Well, if I get 15 cents in a liquidation and 10 cents in a reorganization, we should just sell it and be done with it. There's that concept in the second bullet of feasibility. We do not want you coming in, using the bankruptcy process to kind of see where you're at and coming back in and doing it again the next year and the next year and the next year. If you file for bankruptcy, we want to see a robust plan that will not have you back in bankruptcy court within the next three to five years. And then if, if everything works, you exit and you get to go on and, and live your life again. Now, I'm, I'm more or less hitting my marks here, but um, I will uh, try to speed this up a little bit. Um, uh, municipal bankruptcy is different from chapter 11 bankruptcy. So I started with chapter 11 and said, this is how bankruptcy typically works. Now we're going to talk about the way chapter nine is different. Very interesting history of chapter nine bankruptcies. Uh, Congress passed the statute in 1934 saying states could authorize municipalities to file for bankruptcy. What happened in the 1930s, right? Depression, dust bowl. 
lots of different municipal organizations had issued bonds, could not satisfy them. So they had a problem. Contracts clause, the United States Constitution says states cannot impair contracts. So what do you do if a municipality has entered into a bond of bonds and can't satisfy them? The state cannot adjust those bonds. So you need some sort of process by which you can equitably adjust the bonds because otherwise you can't get blood from a turnip. So they passed the law. Here comes the conservative Supreme Court and it says, nope, this law is in, in violation of the constitution in 1934 in Ashton v. Cameron County. As far as I can tell, what happened is I think a bunch of people ran around and said, if we can't have federal bankruptcies for municipalities, what in God's name are we going to do? Because three years later, <laughs> they passed a modest revision to the federal bankruptcy legislation that was not different in any meaningful way that I can discern. And another irrigation district took a case through bankruptcy. And this time the Supreme Court said, oh, oh, this is different. This works. OK, this is OK. So Beacons, the United States v. Beacons in 1938 is where the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it, it is OK. But there are rules. So, for example, the key premise here is that you cannot interfere with the sovereignty of a state. We live in a dual sovereign country. Federal government is a sovereign states are sovereigns, right? So we respect the sovereignty of states. Remember when I said that the court is overseeing those chapter 11 bankruptcies? It's true, but it's very different in chapter nine. The court does not, the, the cities don't have an obligation to report. The court cannot interfere with the municipality's ongoing administration, okay? Cannot order the city to do anything or um, uh, that it, in terms of how it provides services. You have to prove that you're insolvent if you're a city before you can file. You don't have to prove that in Chapter 11. In fact, Hertz, the case I told you about earlier, wasn't insolvent. It paid off all its creditors and its equity. City's got to prove insolvency. And interestingly, you have much broader latitude in Chapter 9 in a municipal bankruptcy to adjust your labor contracts. Now, in Michigan, one of the things they realized was that politicians were unlikely to ever want to file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy. So they passed a emergency manager law in this state that allowed for the appointment of an emergency manager for companies that were in or for cities that were in financial distress. And the first emergency manager law in 2012 <clears throat> was uh, hope, they hoped to do it by referendum. And unfortunately, the labor unions in the city and the state of Michigan, they know exactly where this is going, right? The emergency manager is a precondition to filing for chapter nine. Chapter nine is a precondition to cutting pensions in bankruptcy. You cannot cut pensions outside of federal bankruptcy court because pensions are protected by the Michigan constitution. So the unions know exactly where this emergency manager law is going. They rally their forces. And in 2012, the people of the state of Michigan reject the emergency manager law in the referendum. Okay, so a little bit like Ashen v. Cameron County, Governor Snyder at this time looks around and is like, Detroit's still Detroit. Flint is still Flint. Okay, Benton Harbor is still Benton Harbor. You can reject emergency manager laws all you want, but what are we going to do? So Snyder puts through a revised emergency manager law. This one, this time it was not subject to public referendum and this one passed. Now, the way this emergency manager law is that uh, once the state declares a fiscal emergency, it can, and it, it can appoint an emergency manager. The emergency manager at that point has a period of time to study the situation and then decide whether the city ought to file for bankruptcy. It can then make a recommendation to the governor that it file. This emergency manager law was incredibly controversial, okay? Because this goes to democracy, right? People felt like we have elected government in Detroit. We have a mayor. We have a city council. They are our elected representatives. They should decide what we should do. 
the state legislature is now coming over the top and saying those people cannot be trusted to make this type of difficult decision because it is politically unpopular or because they just won't do it for the wrong reasons. You need a emergency manager who's appointed by the state to make this decision. So this was incredibly fraught. You have a city that is 90% black, a Republic, a white Republican governor is saying, I'm going to appoint someone who's going to decide what you can do because you can't handle your business. So that person was like going to be a really important person. Like who is the person you're going to stick into this role? Now there's a large law firm at the time, not mine, that is applying to the city to be considered as its bankruptcy counsel. And they go to the pitch and one of the people they bring to the pitch is one of the leading African-American bankruptcy practitioners in the United States of America. And I'll say, unfortunately, it's a fact that the bankruptcy bar in the United States of America isn't very diverse. Okay. So there are not a lot of black folk that I would run into day in and day out in the bankruptcy bar. Uh, but Kevin Orr was one of them. And when he showed up at that pitch with Jones Day, a lot of light bulbs went off in Governor Snyder's office about who might be the emergency manager for the city of Detroit. And there he is, Kevin Orr. So he was appointed on March 14th, 2013. He files the city on July 18, 2013. And before I get into this, this is about a six minute video. Um, I thought I would pause here to see if there are any questions, because when Kevin Orr came in, the city was roiled. OK, you had pensioners. They know they're going for the pensions. The people of the city are convinced they're being screwed by this white Republican governor. Here's this black man that showed up to be the emergency manager. People are walking up and giving him Oreos all the time. Right. Because he's <laughs> black on the outside and white on the inside. Like. It was a very, very difficult time. And this man stepped into a very, very difficult role. And this is the video that he cut when he was introducing himself to the people of the city of Detroit. Um, but before I hit play on that, I wanted to see if anyone has any questions. I know this has been kind of a long and detailed presentation, but if there are questions, this would be a good time to ask them. I'm happy to stay around after, but I did think it would be kind of fun to see if we couldn't watch this. Everybody loves watching TV, so I knew that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got to give you the microphone. This gentleman in the front row. Thank you. Um, for people who own businesses that provide services to the city, for uh, um, mayors and councilmen who may have uh, um, benefited very much during their tenure, are they at any risk in, in a process like this? Uh, that's a great question. I would say the answer is um, no, you know, there, the, there is no incremental process that would expose them to criminal liability beyond the basic aspects of criminal law. So if they did something bad, if they engaged in bribery or mismanagement, uh, you know, criminal act, their criminal liability is the same. Um, I will say this, though. Whenever I tell people I was involved in the city of Detroit bankruptcy, I think this will come through a lot more in the second class than in the first one. A lot of people say to me, oh, yeah, because of Kwame Kilpatrick. So what you have to understand, and one of the things I tried to show in this class is this is tectonic forces that lead to the decline of a city. OK, we're talking macroeconomic forces, macro political forces. This isn't. Kwame Kilpatrick gave a sweetheart deal to his buddy and got a hundred grand. The unfunded healthcare liability of the city of Detroit was $4 billion. Okay. So the magnitude of what we're talking about here, this is tens or hundreds of thousands of people leaving. This is billions of dollars of disinvestment in real estate uh, base in order to provide revenue loss of industry, job flight. This is stuff that happens like at a level you can't see. There is corruption and fraud in all American cities at some level. That's not what drives chapter nine. Trust me, I'm from the city of Chicago. If it did, we would have filed a long time ago. Yes, sir. 
having seen no other questions, I'll go ahead and ask one. Absolutely. Sincora. <laughs> What's their uh, legal organization? Are they a typical Chapter C corporation? You know, that's a good question. I don't even know. We were like a Bermuda based, okay. you know, I got it. So, so, it, it got super con confusing because we had been restructured. So we were restructured in 08. So all I can say is we got to the limits of my ability to actually know something legally in terms of how complicated it got because my client had insured an already fabulously complicated financial arrangement that involved a swap of interest rates. It's so complicated that I think I might be the only person in the world that actually understood all of this stuff. And then to make it more complicated, the city started to default right in 08 at the same time that Sincora was in Bermuda-based restructuring proceedings. So it was just a mess. And what popped out of it was this amendment to the underlying documents that, frankly, no one understood how it worked, which is a very bad position to be in, okay? <laughs> Because when people look at a pile of documents and they're like, what in God's name is this? And you're like, well, you know, you're in trouble legally. You're just never going to get there. And I have pensioners who are like, I had a deal. I held up my part. You owe me money. And I'm like, well, you know, there's this swap. And then there was a pledge of casino revenue. And we were in Bermuda-based restructuring proceedings. So that's why JP Morgan, who was our insured, decided to agree to the amendment, even though we had the right to do that. And they didn't consult with us. So we signed it, but we didn't necessarily approve it. Now it's in brief. Like after some point, people are like, what is this guy talking about? No one knows, right? So complexity is your enemy when you're a trial lawyer. And that's why in part, I don't even know what Chris <laughs> legal organization was. So were they actual bondholders as oh. well as insurers of so bonds? This is a great question, and I'll preview it because this is where we're- Just a high level. No, yeah, we're going to start this. So uh, next class, we'll start with this because okay. you got to understand the players. But cities sell bonds because they need money. The bonds are a form of debt. People like us buy the bonds, but we don't want to just buy bonds and take the risk that the city won't pay us back. So cities sell the bonds with bond insurance. So there is an insurance company that says, if the city doesn't pay, I will pay. Then people like us go, well, this is awesome because in order for me to not get paid, not only does the city have to fail, but this insurance company has to fail. And the insurance companies are always very strong, vital organizations. Unless you're AIG. Uh, well, the problem with 2008 was that it was only Berkshire Hathaway in the entire world that could serve as a surety in these relationships because right. everybody was screwed, including right. us. But in theory, this deal, my deal was done in 04. So in 04, I'm AAA, I'm great, right? I'm Sincora. And so I'm this great insurer and you should buy the bonds because you have this protection. Then the whole world changes in 08. Everything broke. And so now even your insurance company is insolvent. But when the city files, the way it's supposed to work is the insurer pays off the bonds and then the insurer becomes the bonds vis-a-vis -vis the city. So I was the lucky holder of uh, about three or $400 million in bond debt claims against the city because I was paying off the bondholders. Although we didn't pay the bondholders in full because we ran around and threatened them that they weren't going to get paid because we were going to file for bankruptcy again and made them take less than a dollar. So it's a rough game. Uh, yeah, so, it's a great question. Well, yeah, thanks. I'm happy to hear you're going to go into that a little more next time. Yes, yeah, that's my, the devil. My point is these folks, Sincora and other bondholders, are not naive. These are big boys, right? Yeah. They're serious big boys. Um, and... They know how to make decisions about risk. They know how to assess risk. That's more or less, I wouldn't say it's a science to the extent that I'm aware of it, but it's you know largely agreed upon what people tend to make different decisions on is how much risk they want to accept and what the cost is. That's right. So these are very big boys. They've got math models. They know exactly what they're doing, right? Yep. And I don't want... 
I'm, I'm reluctant, as you can tell, I'm a Michigan person. Yeah. And uh, I don't want people to think that Detroit took advantage of Sincora because Sincora was somebody who couldn't stand up to Detroit. No, it's so, a great point. So, so my other question was going to be, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Is there a separate code, separate chapter in the code? around municipalities and you already answered that one chapter chapter nine if that's right be the proper one. well this point here i'll close Basically. on this point it's a great point okay there is a difference i think morally between a pensioner who is maybe in 1970 starting to work as a secretary in a city that we saw is still had a lot going for it and so it signs up to a pension deal it's a long-term pension deal you know without disparaging any person that person's ability to sort of cut a different deal or, you know, they are represented by unions, so they have their own sophistication, but, you know, that person cut a fair deal. Sincora coming in in 2004, after uh, a few things that happened in the city of Detroit, getting paid a big fee to provide this insurance, you know, that's not the same. However, I will tell you this, no matter how much I got beaten up in the press for you guys are sophisticated, you're Wall Street, you know what you're doing. There were all these gigantic German banks that had bought these types of bonds, which were arguably illegal. So we'll get into this later. But the bonds were like, there's good arguments that these bonds should never have been issued and that they were illegal. So here's a piece of investment advice. Don't buy bonds that might be illegal. Okay. <laughs> Ever. Especially not from a municipality. The whole point of municipality is it's safe investing. Money was so loose in 04, it's chasing yield. It is flowing all over the place. So these German banks buy a crap load of these garbage can bonds from the city of Detroit. They buy hundreds of millions of dollars. Detroit goes into bankruptcy in 2013. And I got to know their lawyer really well. He's a friend of mine. He said... His clients asked him, why doesn't the city just issue additional currency? Okay, so in Germany, where you have currency controls that are at the provincial level, they were like, I don't understand why the state doesn't just print additional money, pay off the debt, and effectively refinance like Brazil or other places do when they have a debt crisis. So... They're sophisticated in theory. How much they knew about this stuff, I have no idea. I don't understand why anyone bought these bonds in the first place. So I've gone over my time. I will say this, this Kevin Orr video can be found on YouTube. I think it's kind of a nice video. If you would like to read a good book on the city that will help you get ready for our next class, there's a book called Detroit Resurrected by Nathan Bomey. That is a very accessible book that may make the second class a bit more accessible. I'm going to work to do that as well. There's also a documentary out called Gradually Then Suddenly that you can find if you kind of search around on the internet. These are all things that may facilitate the second class, but I really appreciate your attention today, and I hope you liked it. Uh, I want to thank you, Steve. <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. You might maybe could show us this next time at the beginning. Sure. Uh, and I hope uh, we hope to see you all back for the next class in two weeks. Yeah. Thank you very much.